Hey everybody, it's Earth Skills with Jeff Gottlieb, and I have a special guest this time, Zev Friedman, and uh, we're going to talk about, well, our interesting backgrounds, how we got to be practitioners of these interesting skills and, and arts and areas of knowledge, and uh, particularly, Zev is a, a permaculturist. He teaches permaculture to students. He um, puts people through internships and trainings, and he designs um, uses for landscape and people's kind of properties, life efforts, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. More than properties. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because as we talked about before, permaculture is not just about mm -hmm. how to get your garden going. Yeah, it's a design sense that we'll we'll talk about the particulars and the. The ideas of it, um, but one thing that one thing that occurred to me is that we have a lot of knowledge in common and skills in common, mm. but I don't think we got to the the where we are now mm. via the same sort of route. So it might be instructive to mm. hear. Well, how did you get from being a little kid that didn't <laughs> have a a career yet yeah. or a field yet, yeah. and how did we get to be um, mm. in our fields that we're in? Mm. So. I guess I've, I've told the viewers before that I started out as a naturalist. That was my first mm. thing. Ever since I was a little child, I always wanted to know, you know, what animal is that? Where does it live? How big does it get? How do you know that one from the other one? Uh, what does it eat? What eats it? And that was just absolutely fascinating. So mm. I studied zoology mm. in college. And while I was studying zoology, I realized you can't really understand animals very well if you don't understand plants. Mm -hmm. So then I'm looking at um, animal interactions with plants and how they function and they each give something and they each get something and it all works. And then that led me to think about um, the non-living factors. You know, mm -hmm. like what about the minerals? What about the rainfall? What about the temperature? Mm -hmm. What about, you know, all the different things that the living systems are based on, mm -hmm. on top of. And so while I was busy looking at living things working with mm -hmm. their environments, I started to think, well, but what about our kind of living things? How, yeah. are we, how, how do we fit into our environment? And maybe <clears throat> how would, have other people done it? And maybe what could we do that's different that will work even better than what we're doing? Mm. So I started looking at uh, wild edibles and mm. um, different ways people garden and um, making things for myself and then I started to look at other cultures mm. and that led me to um, attend ceremony with native elders and study traditional skills with, with archaeologists mm. and, and mm. stuff like that. So I glued those two things mm. together mm. and then quite a number of years mm. later I was introduced to permaculture kind of from two sources. Mm. One is Patricia Allison. I met her mm. at Firefly, mm. and I sat in on a couple of her workshops, and mm. I was like, what an elegant way of describing mm. things and explaining mm. what's going on mm. and making mm. plans. And, and just, I, I've always liked thing, um, communication about things that's well put and sticks mm -hmm. in your mind well, mm -hmm. and I love the slogans. The, the principles, design principles. Right, yeah. right. They, they just... They're just very handy in your yeah. brain when mnemonic you're mnemonic devices. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so permaculture took all of the ecology knowledge that I had been studying all those years. You know, how does this animal work with this plant, and what you know, what do they need, and what do they give, and what happens when things go out of balance, and yeah, things like that. So, it was it was a really easy slide into an, uh, another whole discipline. Yeah. So now I got the three glued together. It's kind of mm. the, the holy triumvirate there, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, permaculture and primitive skills and mm. nature study. Mm. So I've not so much included permaculture in um, what I do for a living with other people, but Explicitly, certainly, right, right? Yeah, mm. but certainly, well, I shouldn't say that either because it supports those things now. Right, right. Because I've used. The mm. design sense mm. in my property to mm. be able to mm. do my other kinds of work. Mm. Mm. You know, like mm. I'm growing materials that mm. I'm going to use, and it maybe nature put them there. I didn't put them there, but yeah. there's room for them, and they help me. Yeah. And so, you mm. know, it's all. 
the the sure. the divisions are all fuzzy now. You know, it's an so. interlinked system. Who the thunk? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, how did you get there? I don't think I've ever heard this story. All right. We've known each other a long time, but I've yeah. never heard this. Well, I tell it differently each time. I'm sure. Yeah, and it's really interesting to hear your story about coming into this way of kind of systems thinking and design from naturalism, because that's how Bill Mollison, one of the main founders uh -huh. of culture, got to it. Um, and he, he has a fascinating autobiography, by the way, if anyone ever wants to read a very humorous, romping narrative. Mm -hmm. It's a hard book to get because it's out of print, but um, oh. but he came to it through naturalism as well, and working in Australia and in New Zealand and in the rainforest there, and then he got into anthropology, and that, so it was a similar kind of thing out of which his wow. insights, working with David Holmgren, his grad student, mm -hmm. and that's what permaculture came out of, was the study of ecosystems originally and natural organisms and how they survive and work. And for me, I, I think, I don't remember being as, as tuned into the food web when I was a kid, as, as you're describing, but I, was, I spent a lot of time outside because I grew up in this notorious three-acre south-facing kudzu patch <laughs> that my father, Avram Friedman, still lives in, in a house, and uh, along with two or three hundred groundhog companions. Uh -huh. and, uh, <laughs> and so I spent a lot of time outside in that landscape, with my, especially with my friend Tayo and, in, and Ty Halleck, and, and in his the um, big forested property that he grew up on over in Whittier. And we were running around a lot in the woods and doing all kinds of things, but I wasn't as tuned into the actual what was eating what and the kind of nutrient transfer stuff that was going on. What I came to it more through the doorway of, I think, was then when I became, when I was maybe 17 years old, I, I started understanding for myself somehow the same things that had been talked about in my household my entire growing up and yet somehow hadn't made their way all the way in <laughs> about the, the kind of ecological and social um, catastrophes that our species has been creating for, depending on how you counted, the last 10,000 or 6,000 or especially 250 years. And I started to really perceive both the elegant beauty of natural ecosystems and in the same motion the level of destruction and loss that we're creating amidst them and that all came in this kind of rush of insight and so then I, I began to feel a, a um, dedication to doing something about it and to uh, and I was also starting to read about indigenous cultures and the loss of indigenous languages and life ways and indigenous rights and people getting kicked off their ancestral lands by industrial pressures and economic pressures and, and um, ideologies. And so I started to kind of just read and learn and watch things and talk to people. And, and I was, it was like a, a, a switch had been flipped. And so then the question for me became, what do I do about this? And the rest of my life has really been an answer to that question or an attempt to, to or a series of responses to that question. Mm -hmm. And there have been several major themes to it. And permaculture is one of them, one of the biggest themes in my response to that because <clears throat> I think of it, permaculture isn't a, um, it's not an ideology, it's not even a basket full of practices, it's not even a basket full of ideas, it's a way of thinking and approaching life. And so that, which is when you really get down to it, I think, um, and why it runs so well together with earth skills is that in my life it, it's, it's a, it's an approach to being indigenous is what it comes down to. Indigenous meaning to be from a place. That's what indigenous, the kind of etymology is, to be from a place. And so permaculture is a way of humans paying enough attention to an ecosystem that we live inside of to become part of that, a functioning part of that ecosystem, including meeting our own needs. That's the way I think about it. And so when we get really good at it, just like with Earth Skills, you go to Papua New Guinea or to the Cherokee or to people in Ireland, everyone makes cordage out of different materials and everyone eats different wild foods and different cultivated foods and everyone builds their houses in different ways that are tuned into the ecosystem and the weather patterns and everyone has rituals and mythologies that are based in the plants and animals and weathers and proximity to oceans and rivers and those places. And so the way that that's tuned in, that's how 
we become indigenous, and um, and that's what permaculture is. But I actually think of it as a transitional strategy. That's the way I try to live it in my life. Is is I think of I, I hope that in 150 years we don't have the word permaculture if our species still exists. <laughs> I hope that we do exist, and I hope that we don't have the word permaculture yeah, we because. Just have Culture. We just have diverse. I'd say like one definition I'll sometimes use in, in mixed company like this. <laughs> in company like this is is is, is, is that permaculture is a transition strategy for regrowing diverse biocultural life ways. Okay. And so that's what it is. It's like, and if it succeeds, we regrow diverse biocultural life ways and we mm -hmm. survive. And if something like it doesn't succeed, our spe our p species is on an extinction path. So that's that's basically what I'm looking at is. How do we have a deeply transformative approach to human life where we're basically having to reconsider and regrow most aspects of the way that humans exist and think and relate with each other and the landscape? And if we don't manage to grow new systems that are diverse like that, then we're going to drive ourselves extinct through violence and through genocide and through climate change and, other, and species extinction. And so for me, permaculture is a survival strategy and a transition strategy to diverse biocultural life ways. And that's why I see, how I seek to practice it in my own life. I'm a professional. I make a living doing this because we have a cash economy right now. Uh -huh. But I, I don't think we, that in 150 years, I hope we don't have professionals. It's just we have mentorship and we have intergenerational transfer of knowledge. And so right now, the classes I teach and the design work I do for groups and individuals and their properties and stuff, that's just to get it going is to relight the fire of um, the desire to be indigenous and the ways of learning that are required to do that. Yeah, I I, um, I heard a, a point come through that has a, a name attached to it that mm. I'd like people to consider and that mm. is regenerative. Mm, yeah. Not just I'm doing not, not just sustainable. Mm -hmm. Sustainable means I can keep doing it. Regenerative means the whole system gets better. Yeah. And you know, it's it's not even that hard. Like to build soil, yeah. We have we have all kinds of well, we have mining. Yeah. You know the way that we we do agriculture means that things are just taken out of the soil and carried yeah. away, taken out of the soil and carried away, and the only yeah. thing that gets put back is what can keep it going another year. Yeah. But it's not even as good as it was last yeah. year. Right. The, the nutrient year. density of the food right. has declined since the since World War One in the US because of that. Oh yeah. Yeah, because yeah. And the thickness of the topsoil due to erosion because yeah. we're not, you know, we're not covering the soil. I, yeah, I I totally understood the kind of native viewpoint of the earth as a living being. Mm. Uh, not not necessarily the Gaia hypothesis, but mm. maybe Gaia hypothesis is yeah. saying that the Earth is a living being, and it you know it's like any organism. It has different organs, none of which mm. function without all the other ones, and right. you know so that so if you think of the Earth as that, then you could think of the the crust where mm. we, all the life is located as the living skin mm -hmm. and if you tear skin off yeah. and you don't let it heal back and you don't keep it protected and you don't mm -hmm. you know you let it dry out and let things damage it it, it will not go well yeah so so I I, no. I quickly adopted that metaphor and now it is I have a horror of bare soil yeah. if I drive by a place and somebody has turned over the soil like there's a there's a little a small farm, big garden down the road from me, and they they plow up the soil in this garden, and they do nothing with it yeah. for a month at a time. Yeah. And I look at it and go, all the nitrogen is leaving, all of the organisms are dying, and stuff. You know, and my garden, I just even if I don't have living systems on it, I at least have mulch on it. Yeah. So even if I don't have any skin grown over and I have a band aid. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because you look at the the uh, kind of recent traditional farming practices around here, and there yeah. usually are reasons that people do things, oh, yeah. but yeah. the reasons are themselves responses to previous poor systems that existed. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, mm -hmm. if you know, a lot of times when people are tilling up in the spring like that, which is a common practice for planting a corn patch, what they're doing is they're 
there, there's often a wet spring, so they're trying to break up the soil and actually dry the soil out yeah. and make it more exposed to the sun so it heats up so the corn can grow better in warm soil. Mm -hmm. But that whole situation is a response to having made the choice to grow in the floodplain in the first place. Mm -hmm. Which is a bad idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and well, so I plug, some plug, years yeah. it works out fine, and this <laughs> year maybe not so much. Yeah. Uh, those of you who are in Western North Carolina might be aware of the news. We've had so much rain, almost 20 inches of rain this month, which meant that all the major rivers and large creeks are way above their banks, and they're literally in the floodplain, the, the French right. Broad River that runs through Asheville. Yeah. I was at, higher up, like Toots Brevard, the, there are roads that leave the main road and just go in the water because yeah. it, it's all flooded. It's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. 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 That's so not a choice that indigenous people would make to put their big buildings and and farms that they yeah. rely on food for in the floodplain where they can be destroyed every spring. Uh, yeah. I don't know about that because if you look at, if you look at, um, like, Katua Field, the Cherokees well, planted there continuously yeah. for 3,000 years. Yeah. It's certainly possible for Tuckasegee to flood that. Possible. And every now and then, yeah. it's not a bad thing for the soil. It's just that that year's crop will get ruined. Yeah. But in terms of all these micro floodplains, like down next to creeks that flood yeah. regularly, like yeah. at Earth Haven, for instance, where I live, or lots of other places where you see human settlements, people have built their houses down yeah. just above. Right along the creek. Yeah. yeah. That's, um, that's, I don't think, a winning strategy. Yeah. Well. But it comes also from. If you're willing to constantly redo it. Yeah. What also is related to, to social economic conditions of our region and that a lot of poor European settler people got forced off the nicest land. Some yeah. of them got big yeah. land grants and the rest of them and the native people got forced onto the marginal land and away from yeah. the large valleys where they could choose to grow on moderate slopes rather than directly mm -hmm. down next to the creek. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's all tied together. Yeah. Yeah, so many things are tied together. It's, yeah. it's, it's the more the more I think, the more I learn about the different parts, the more it makes sense of how it all fits. And you end up talking about one thing, and in a moment you're talking about something yeah. that would get another category <laughs> if you bothered to yeah. pull it apart. Uh, it's it's like when I was in college, just for fun, I took the, the whole course offerings booklet, and I tried to find two classes mm. in any two departments where I couldn't think of anything that the material had in common and I couldn't do it. Right. I mean, and it could be everything from French to industrial arts to, mm. uh, you know, yeah. English literature to, you know, just any two classes in any two departments. If I could think creatively for a moment, I could see Oh well, if you know this, then that would help you do that. And yeah. So, so yeah. 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 I mean, that's the source of a lot of the most cre creative approaches is that so-called interdisciplinary. But that's the way our minds. And you were talking about mnemonic devices yeah. earlier. That's like with permaculture and the principle, the permaculture design principles, which is like twelve to twenty design principles, depending yeah. on who you talk to. What those really are is a gateway. Each of the principles is a gateway into systems thinking mm -hmm. and it's, mm -hmm. it's you know they're all whether you're talking about every element having multiple functions or yeah. creatively using and responding to change or produce no waste each of those is the permaculture principle sure. they just all lead to the same david holmgren says it's like the house of whole systems thinking and each of those is a doorway into the mm -hmm. house of whole systems thinking and i like the yeah. word house there because the right. the root of the word house is mm. from the greek oikos, oikos right. which is where ecology. we got ecology and economy yeah <laughs> yeah which totally makes sense and if you think of i i always thought of economy as being strictly what's money doing no but i've come to understand by listening to podcasts by economists mm. economists are thinking about well why is it this way? Mm -hmm. And what are people doing that produces this? And can we count on that information? It's all about people and right. um, and motivation, scientific method, yeah. verbally, and culture and and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And looking at looking at value in more than one way, which mm -hmm. is like, which is I think um, where a lot of people end up with unsatisfying lives because they yeah. miss the other kinds of value that they don't yeah. even know are valuable. So they, they go after just one or two kinds yeah. and they don't realize that 
having a close group of friends and people to collab friends and neighbors and people you collaborate with right is, makes your life better yeah and it, it supports the other things in there and yeah. you know all the different kinds of capital I've heard people describe yeah. social capital and yeah. you know yeah all this yeah relational capital social yeah. capital yeah money capital mm -hmm. there's eight different times types of capital I think the way that it's described yeah, yeah. and so I've always almost purposely tried not to think of things in terms of money and economics. Transactional. But yeah. now it, yeah, you know, just to say, you know, that uh, <clears throat> value is in dollars, period. Yeah. But that's, but now that I see that, that econ econo economics is so much more and it's so much more of a holistic look at things, now it cheerfully fits right into my thoughts about permaculture, my uh -huh. thoughts about uh, market gardening and about um, how I make a living as a naturalist and a primitive skills instructor. Yeah. You know? And since I've had my little homestead, so much of those other forms of capital have come into play. Mm. Like if I'm, if I'm needing fibers to teach people about rope making, um, I work with a plant called dogbane who Mm -hmm. uh, which sheds a lot of seeds when you yeah. work with it and process it. And uh, apparently some of those seeds found fertile soil and they started growing on my place by myself. <laughs> and now I have a dogbane patch. Yeah. Even though it's a pretty uncommon plant yeah, here I, in the mountains, yeah. I think it doesn't really like clay. Right. Well, likes my clay, apparently. Mm -hmm. you know. so, so I just look at, I look at the wild plants and the plants that I put in, and I'm always looking to acquire more plants that do something. Yeah. And I, you know, I was, last time I came with six plants that think I think would be great on your homestead kind mm. of thing. So, and some of the things that I talked about were that um, well, like, why would you want a plant? You would want a plant if you can eat it. You would want a plant if it makes medicine. You would want a plant if it produces something that you can utilitarian right. in some way. You would want a plant if it helps your other plants. Yeah. You would want a plant if it regenerates soil. Yeah. You know. So creates beneficial insects. Have yeah, right, right. Pollinators yeah, and yeah, insects. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And you know, everything from trap crops to Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, predatory wasp habitat. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard for me to call something a weed and rip it out. Right. You know, because a lot of the plants that would love to fill in my garden and crowd my tomato plants, I'm like, but if I leave that, I'll, I'll eat that. That's delicious. Yeah. You know, like the lamb's quarters. Yes, it will get to be seven feet tall and, <laughs> and be really bushy, but it'll also make many pounds, one plant will make many pounds of really nutritious food in yeah. here. With a much less effort than spinach. <laughs> wow. yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, so, so I, it's a kind of a delightful dilemma for me to look at a plant and decide whether it stays or it's got to move aside. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, hmm, what's the, what's the idea there? It used, to, I hear people talk about, like, I, I hate to kill a plant for any reason. It's like, well, plants kill other plants for reasons all the time. Yeah. And so I could see, you know, pulling weeds out if it's helping the system, but then they're not going to waste at all. Right. They're going to be composted, or they're yeah. going to be mulched, or they're going to be fed to my rabbits, or yeah. they're going to be, you know, there's a lot of stuff that... Yeah, I mean, that's you're, you're, you're reminding me of the permaculture principle, produce no waste, mm -hmm. where it's like the assertion that the idea of waste is just that. It's a verb. It's yeah. an idea. Waste is something that humans do. There is no substance yeah. called waste, even though we design our society and economy that's right. and do that. That's, right. that's based on the capitalist economic idea of profit and externalities, where I want to have a laser focus to produce some product or service as cheaply as possible and sell it for as high of a cost as possible, which means there are going to be collateral damages, which industry calls externalities mm -hmm. and if, if I can get away without having to pay for those things then I can make more money and that's called waste we call that it's, waste it, now that I'm now that I'm awake about these things yeah. that strikes me as a really stupid plan it is because yeah <laughs> all you gotta do well is think and then 
it's kind of like I, my rabbits are a great example, you know, because I'm raising rabbits. Why? So I can get rabbits? Okay, fine. They're going to drop all that manure. I could look at that manure and say, oh, what, what am I going to do with all that rabbit waste product? It's <laughs> yeah. awful. They even, people it's, call it, they call it manure waste. Waste. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> Human waste. And then right. I yeah. then I read, a, I read a little article about this, and it said that if you're raising rabbits and all you get from them is the manure, it'll pay That's for the rabbit it. food. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so like, I think of that with so-called weeds in the garden, like in our garden right now, we're dealing with big populations of mugwort mm -hmm. and uh, common vetch. And the common vetch was seeded by somebody who used to live there. She had an idea for how she was going to use it to fix nitrogen in the garden, and it's problematic. The mugwort crept in from the, from the, from the edges and, and seeded uh -huh. last year, and there are tons of mugwort plants. So uh, now, in, in both those cases, like, yes, you could say, Mugwort is a valuable medicinal and kind of ritual plant. You could be, we could be harvesting and make bundles. We're doing some of that. How much can you find a market for? Exactly. Or that's or, a, that's a know. big question. And then, and then that you could say, yes, it's nitrogen fixing and it's improving it the soil. And it is. And we are finding that they're too competitive for us to grow annual crops next to. So we're digging them out. So then the permaculture way of thinking suggests, all right, where is the opportunity in this challenge? We're having to do all this work. How can we at least the problem is make the this the most? The yeah, I like to say that the, the where is the opportunity nested mm -hmm. in the challenge? Because mm -hmm. the word problem is this thing that fascists, it's a word that fascists use a lot. They do. Mm -hmm. It's like the Germans were really into that and the I Jewish think, problem and all I that. I think the word problem uh, of more like uh, mathematics. All right. You know, like I'll give you a math problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It won't hurt you. Uh -huh. You just try to solve it. Well, that's all. That's interesting. But when and you look at how you mathematicians like a good problem to solve, but human yeah. culture is not a math problem, and certain people have used that word Don't in tell problematic us ways over time. They, anyway, they feel that way. so so I'm so anyway, whatever different languages, yeah. but but so so I was saying, all right, well, so here we are. We're using a broad fork. We're broad forking these beds down to eight to twelve inches depth, so we can get the roots of the mugwort right. and the vetch out. So while we're doing it. Let's work in biochar compost, mm -hmm. and we actually needed to change the shape of some of our beds to uh, create a flood irrigation possibility because the paths weren't quite on contour from the when they were originally built. So now we're using the moment when we're digging all this soil and loosening right. it to change the shapes of the beds. Because that's so, a lot of your energy. Exactly, at that point. and then that's going to allow us to irrigate without plastic because now we can flood the pathways without using plastic. Um, uh, drip lines, for instance. Okay. Now we can flood the pathways which are on contour, and the pa the pathways will spill over evenly into the downhill the, bed. The, the dike. The exactly, water. and the pathways are just U-shaped swales on mm -hmm. contour. Fill those up with water from the rainwater tank, and they flood over and irrigate the beds. So this is an example of how we can find an opportunity in a yeah. challenge. And like, even though they didn't have to do with the plant species themselves and using the mugwort and the vetch zoomed out a little bit and say, right. okay, how can this moment of effort right. serve as many functions as Some, possible? Something yeah. made you dig. Right. Now that you're digging, right. what good things can come? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that works. Mm -hmm. And that's what people, indigenous people, do all around mm -hmm. the world. It's like when we're surviving and making our own food and medicine and fiber and houses, it's like every little action, you want it to count. You don't want to do more yeah. work than you have to, and yeah. you're feeding your family depends on successful use of human energy and so people have figured out all of these ingenious ways of laying out our villages and our houses and making the trip to the, the canoe trip to, to to go fishing you're also doing other things on the way and you're trading with a neighboring tribe and bringing something yeah. to them and it's like you're getting multiple uses out of every action as much as possible i've always yeah. thought about when i'm teaching wilderness survival which is kind of a, a modern day well we have a lot of modern conveniences, and we have very nice houses. You can't get to any of those right now. What are you going to do? So right. I like to I like to kind of collect slogans and mnemonics and ways to think about things. And I'll 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 say to my students, uh, there aren't enough hours in a day to do things one at a time. Yeah. You know, you're just right. busy all the time. You yeah. Run out of time. Yeah. And yet. That's kind of how we how we do it in yeah. dominant culture at this this point. Yeah, it's really it is compartmentalized and you know and it's it's difficult to get economies of scale and it's difficult yeah. to collaborate and it's difficult to uh, share the products and it's difficult to like 
you know, even with maybe something that can't be helped, but certainly something that brings this up is um, single parent families. Hmm. You know, and where you know, even if even if it wasn't an intact nuclear family, yeah, if people were closer together where they could collaborate, yeah, collaborate on everything from childcare to sharing a refrigerator to I don't I don't care what it is, yeah. But if we make it so that every little unit has its own household that has to take care of all its own needs all by itself, that means everybody has to buy every product yeah. and everybody has to heat that separate space and get all their emotional line. needs met from that small number of people they're yes, living with and what yeah. if someone gets sick who takes care of the household right. and yeah it's yeah it's a well, yeah. it's a dysfunctional system yeah so i think it's i think it's part and parcel to why people are unhappy and unwell mm -hmm. because it's not good for you yeah Just, so luckily you and i both know mm -hmm. systems and people who want to do it a different way, who understand that you yeah. know, the, the isolated nuclear family is just not all that, not all that good a deal. Yeah. So we know, I mean, we've been thinking about community and how communities form. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that, uh, that started me on community thinking was uh, Scott Peck's book. Mm. Uh, um, just just reread it. Um, a Different Drum. Mm. It's called, and it, it's kind of early 1980 mm. thinking about what what is a community and how do communities form and what are the attributes of a community and about yeah. community formation. It's really it's really nicely described about the psychology of community mm. formation. It's mm. a really nice book, really. Mm. Nice book. Um, and so thinking about that, and then I was thinking that you know I just could not get ahead as a consultant in the suburbs on Long Island. Mm. I just could not. I could not manage to do anything except hand to mouth, pay my bills, mm -hmm. and keep a roof over my head. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, there's another way. Mm -hmm. And I heard David Winston, who's an oh, yeah. adopted Cherokee medicine man yeah. and a, a well-known herbalist, um, really wanted to see community forming. And so he brought this up with a group of friends that we used to do sweat lodges together. Um, and he had consultants come in and talk about... Um, native solutions to this need for community and uh, so we were planning on doing this sort of thing uh. and uh, it didn't pan out mm -hmm. like founding a community is a hard process Whew. you know yeah uh, a piece of land that's big enough that you can yeah. afford the people have different ideas about what it is that they're looking yeah. for and we all come in with our scars assumptions and, and our and assumptions wounds, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and uh, you know we don't even know that we're you know, unreasonable and unhealthy in what we're asking for yeah. that is until you have a community and you sit down in meetings then it all comes spilling yeah. out of people <laughs> yeah so we're, we're each uh, connected to a number of different communities and they can be like temporary ones where we just get together to do a thing uh -huh. and then we're happy that we did it and then we all go back to our homes and we don't uh -huh. talk uh -huh. to it. And then we have communities where you know you live you live at a, a really strongly founded, long lived, successful community yeah. earth thing. Got plenty of flaws and cracks, but yeah. Yeah, it's twenty five years well, it's in full of humans. Yes, full of humans. Yeah. Do you want to talk about how that fits with the permaculture principles and sure and what we would so, yeah, yeah, Earth Haven Eco Village is where I live. It's down in northern Rutherford County, um, about an hour southeast of Asheville, and it uh, was founded in 1995. Um, the land was purchased at the end of 1994, and um, and it was founded on. I mean, it was it was part of. It's an eco village, and the whole eco village concept came directly out out of the permaculture movement. So it was it was how do we apply these permaculture, um, this permaculture approach at a community scale because people who have been practicing and experimenting with permaculture recognize that doing nuclear family design in backyards and so on wasn't going to have the type of transformational effect on our economy and culture that we need to survive and to grow the kind of future that we're imagining. And they said, how do we do this at a community scale? And that's so you weren't only about. thinking about forming the community to serve the community, but forming the community to serve the bigger needs. Yeah, well, and, uh, yeah. To be, and of course, I wasn't a part of founding Earth Even. I was, yeah. I was uh, 
14 years old when it was founded. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I would have if I could have. But, uh, um, yeah, I mean, so the, the founders, there were 12 founders mm -hmm. who, who participated in buying the land and, um, and setting it all up. And, yeah, the mission of Earth Haven is an inherently uh, educational mission. So that's right. What, what, you know, the, the, what they said is there's a, there's a really, one of the things I love the most about permaculture is the attitude towards failure. And, and the attitude that um, if we can make lots of small mistakes, or even big mistakes, but, but mistakes that aren't so bad that they destroy the thing, <laughs> but if we can make lots of small mistakes, then we get to learn from them. And so setting up systems that are ambitious and complex and have lots of experiments you know, designed into them so that we can fail and succeed, but especially fail and then learn from those failures about the nuances of what we're doing. And so Earth Even was deliberately set up that way as a, they call it a living laboratory. Sure. And it is that. Sure. And so it's a 330 acre living laboratory where they, the founders designed it to basically test and experiment with every realm of what we're doing as humans right now with, yes, the landscape and passive solar building and off the grid living and our own water systems and roads and stuff, but also decision making processes uh -huh, and uh -huh. living arrangements and ritual and spiritual life and family life and um, on and on and on and on. Ways of learning and ways of mentorship. It was set up to experiment with all of those different things all at once. And it was maybe too <laughs> ambitious in that way, but but for that reason now there's lots to learn there and so that's why yeah, we have all kinds of tours and classes at Earth even and the whole thing is focused around um, creating that living laboratory so that other people can come and learn and then hopefully not make the same mistakes okay. at their, in their projects and right. go out and replicate. And t tens of thousands of people have come through Earth even and, and learned there in classes and tours and are taking is, it out to other projects. Is yeah. anybody tracking hmm. the big picture holistic <laughs> learning? Impact. Yeah, like yeah, it, how does uh, it work as an entire system? Like right. you could say... Well, we made this decision about who gets to make the decisions about right. growing places on land, and we've made that decision about how we're going to do water, and we've made that decision about soil conservation, and we've made that decision about whether we allow free roaming cats, and we've right. made that yeah, decision yeah, 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 yeah. about, you know, all these different things, but is anybody... How are they interrelated? Yeah, is yeah. anybody tracking the whole... Um, that would require like a full-time full research team, I so bet it unfortunately would. the answer is no. And then we would, if you you know, want to help us get a $10 million grant for that, that would be awesome. <laughs> no, I mean, but, be, I'll, be but I'll help ask the questions and track down the connections. That's yeah. fun. Well, yeah. one of the things, one of the, I mean, something that would be useful for that is that Earth Haven has done a very good job at tracking its decision-making process. Mm -hmm. It has... Like what was the decision and what was the result and then, yeah. and then evaluate the result and yeah well evaluation is probably the weakest point but mm -hmm. because of that requires tracking and follow through but but the decision making process the um the in councils which are held every two weeks every mm -hmm. second Sunday uh, the any proposal that's brought to change something proposals there are different than in the United States political system <laughs> where someone just chooses a position and then bitterly advocates for that yeah, thing yeah. at all costs. At Earth Even, in order to submit a formal proposal, you have to list the drawbacks to your proposal and to your idea. And you have to systematically list every possible con of your idea and then address that con uh -huh. and how that's going to either is acceptable for some reason or is going to be dealt with in, in another way. So it actually builds systems thinking into the decision making process. Like you literally lot. can't bring a proposal unless you think about the underbelly of it first and address the underbelly of it. And so what that's done then is that every proposal that's passed is is pretty rigorously vetted um, and then and, and talked about how it's going to uh, it, people anticipate it affecting other parts of the Earth even system. But then I would say the weakest point is evaluation and and how five years down the road that choice okay. actually it, it sounds like yeah. you, you putting most of your eggs in pre-evaluation. That's true. Think first. Which is easier yeah. than post-evaluation, <laughs> tracking the complex results of choices right. that we make, that which branch out in all directions. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I've been familiar with Earth Haven for a few years now, and I've seen a lot of these things play out and heard a lot of opinions about how yeah. people like certain aspects of it. And, you know, I, and our, Arjuna is, of course, Mm. One of the founders and yeah. also um, one of the kind of 
point people that mm -hmm. speaks to people that are coming to be interested in the place and yeah. and the people. So uh, she's a good person to talk to when you want to hear well, what's it like here and yeah. what you know what ideas are put into place and uh, and she's also got really strong opinions about those things so yeah. she'll tell you those and that's yeah. good to hear too yeah so it's been yeah it's been really valuable mm. meeting people there and it's just it's just added to how strongly i feel about mm. um community thinking and systems thinking and mm. um and i think all of the different communities and circles that i belong to they're just pointing at a hunger that yeah. people feel for uh, more efficiency and less alienation yeah. and less waste and the pressure off gotta make the dollars gotta make the dollars because if i don't make the dollars can't the survive danger will happen yeah and, you know mm -hmm. you know the next problem that comes along i won't be able to handle it yeah you know and now i live next door to a community that's a lot less uh, formalized union but, acres yeah, yeah union yeah. acres is um, and it's also running a 20-ish year something like right. that um, but they've gone in and out of waves of having all of the members really involved and really present, and now they've had people that, you know, they're not really interested in coming to meetings, they're not really interested yeah. in putting their two cents in, they just live there. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, all right, I'm not judging, I'm just, yeah. I'm just a, I'm just a really happy neighbor because they're really, mm. really great neighbors. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's just another way, and all the different circles and all the different communities that I belong to, Again, it's like it's like your new plan. You, you, there's advantages and there's drawbacks. If there yeah. weren't advantages, people would go, mm, nah, and right. they wouldn't, wouldn't keep showing up. Yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so my other circles that are really growing are all of the primitive skills gatherings that yeah. I teach at. Yeah. And it used to be that they were aimed at people that wanted to learn about the old ways. Right. So it was more strongly anthropology based. Right. You know, people would like. Well, I'm really into Native American technology, so I want to learn how to make a stone axe. Right. It's like, great. And kind of at like a hobby level or like a novelty level. Or no, something. I mean, professional archaeologists well, as oh, well. It's like, oh, right, I right. really need to understand stone tools better. Like because we're right. finding, architect we're yeah, finding yeah. Um, artifacts, and mm -hmm. we need to understand more about, well, how did that artifact get produced in the first place? Right. Why did it end up in that location? And you know what do people use it for? Yeah. And what are the the failures that that you know like if I yeah. find an artifact that's broken, right? Why did it fail? Right. You know, and you have to learn how it's made before you can learn how it fails. Yeah. You have to learn about the geology and the yeah. so it, and the human motivation and understanding yeah, yeah. how they were cooking. Why did they make they, yeah. those yeah. points that shape and not this shape? Yeah. Because those people over there made them that shape. Right. And maybe we don't. We still don't even know. Yeah. But people get. It's interesting, those the point types that people made their spear points and arrowheads, they seem to be very, very, very glued to the particular culture and language group and people. Yeah. And, and partly the people's identities, we are the people who make right. our spear yeah. points look right. like that. Right, right, right. And those people that make them different, they're not. Right, well, that's kind of like they're, in, yeah. even in my understanding, is in, in Eastern Band Cherokee, from clan to clan, there were certain clans that ate acorns. And other fans uh -huh. that didn't, and the ones that didn't called the other ones acorn eaters. Uh -huh. And that was disparaging, right? So it's like it's like that. It's like we develop the cultural yeah. identity. Yeah, we thing. are the ones who. Yeah, and right. We, yeah. We are the ones who don't eat acorns. Those filthy acorn eaters over there, they eat acorns, yeah. <laughs> I have to show you an article somebody copied from me once. It was uh, talking about research in Europe about acorn eating. And when acorn, one of the things that was system, systematically done was to convince acorn eaters to st stigmatize and stop eating acorns, because then you could control their food base and yeah. you could you could defeat them. They're physically yeah. stronger yeah. and more and healthier in general and harder to fight yeah. if they're acorn eaters. Yeah, and so there was a you know stig yeah. uh, that's pig food. You right, don't eat that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then, you, then they'll let you cut down the big oak trees to, to, to mill them for making buildings, right, too. Right, so then it's not forested, yeah, and yeah. Then, you, then you have less game. Yeah. So it was deer and acorns. So it was right. the king's deer, and right. death to, to hunt the king's deer. Right, poaching. And, right. and acorn eating is 
that's that's not people for the food. Movie. Yeah, and they did the same thing with chestnut. Chestnuts was the peasantry food, mm -hmm. and when the in Italy and Spain, when the and all the the royalty the aristocracy were eating wheat, and so they they called chestnuts peasant food. And there was this I read this account of this uh, of this kind of aristocrat traveling around mm -hmm. studying the common people, and they're eating of chestnut bread. And, uh -huh. and he said, he said, actually, I kind of liked it, but, <laughs> but he said, but, but it made the peasants fart a lot. <laughs> I said that too. Oh, then uh, we gotta totally not do that. Then. Well, and it was the same thing with maize, with corn, when it got brought to Italy. And still to this day, corn is stigmatized as animal food in a lot of places in Western Europe. Hmm. Polenta was originally made from buckwheat. Oh, I never knew that. And transitioned yeah. to corn in some regions of Italy. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing. It's like people, we love to stigmatize and create an other through these yeah. choices of food. And you see that in the U.S. too. It's been, yeah. it's been very yeah. freeing for me to throw that crap thinking away. Yeah. And just like, I'll eat whatever food is food. Right. You know? <laughs> it, it feels good in my body. Yeah. And, yeah. Right, right. If I don't like it, well, now I'm going to have another thing to think. Right. Yeah, right. But yeah, absolutely. So thinking about primitive skills gatherings, it went from mm -hmm. that, which was more technological and historical, yeah. some hobbyists and reenactment sorts of people, right. and professional archaeologists sort of people, and also educators, people that like want to work at a museum or want to, you know, um, interpret yeah. his history stuff. And then over the years, and I've been teaching at these things for 24 years. Uh, it's migrated to more, well, how can I use those skills for me? So yeah. I want to learn about wild edibles because I want to eat them. Yeah. And I want to learn about making buckskin clothing because if I have a buckskin shirt, you can't rip yeah, it. Yeah, it lasts It'll forever. Last forever. Yeah. Right. And it's, and also, it's sexy. Right. And I can yeah. run through the woods and be quiet <laughs> and camouflaged yeah. and not get scratched. Yeah. And all those things. Yeah, practicality. Totally. Yeah. And so people are enjoying also craftsmanship yeah. it is a joy to make something beautiful yeah. Yeah. especially if you're going to then use it yeah so it's gone more to practical yeah. and more to people's whole life yeah. whole life thinking yeah and so so i see a lot of primitive skills gatherings that are now inviting in people teaching about permaculture yeah and, and things like that i'll be there at firefly gathering Absolutely. in a couple of weeks doing well, that firefly yeah. started out i think they were about the first one to say to well, explicitly welcome. Per well, in yeah, and to, to call the event, it's about primitive skills and permaculture right. and homesteading. And earth skills. They started using yeah. the word earth skills more yeah. to include, which now includes like even car repair classes and so on. Which right, are, yeah. right. Well, it's, yeah, do yeah. it yourself and yeah. taking care of your own needs yourself. Self-reliance. Yeah. yeah. So, but the thing about it is not just the, you know, whether you go there and it's of use to you, but that, it used to be that everybody would like go home at the end, and then you would not not go see back to eating yet. Pringles and <laughs> right, right, and you, would, and you wouldn't see the people. I was yeah. at it from yeah. the community angle. You yeah. wouldn't see the people or stay in touch with them necessarily. Yeah. Right. But over the years, it has become more and more valuable yeah. to stay in touch in between yeah. and say, you know, I'm I've been doing the stuff that I've been doing for a long time, so I'm thrilled if somebody who's like 20 says. I really want to learn that, yeah. and I'll say to them, "Come and visit me." Come on over, and they come and do it. Yeah. So there's for formal internships, and I just yeah. call them informal internships. Yeah, yeah. You know, come with the idea that you want to pursue. Yeah. Help me with some of my projects. I'll help you with your projects. We'll have a good time. We'll make food. Yeah. We'll yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we'll have a nice visit. And I've never had a situation where um, I invited somebody to come, and then I was like, "Oh." Please go. It's terrible having you here. I've never had that. Um, wow. Yeah. That's good. Well, and partly it's because when they ask me about it, I don't just like instantly see who they are. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. I gotta like sit with them for a bit yeah. and talk to them about what they want and and yeah. just see if I like them. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Because relationship first. Yeah. Work second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I I really see that in the old days. Like little kids, because you know, if you lived in a small village, you not only know everybody, you're related to everybody. Yeah. So a little kid is absolutely welcome to go to any mm. older person right. and uh, you know sit with them. And, yeah. And, and so there's not that pressure for parents to be everything to yeah. your children. Yeah. You know, auntie over there, 
she's making baskets and yeah. you know the little kids over there going like oh, that's fascinating i want to know yeah. about that and, yeah. and want to spend time and it's not even necessarily about the baskets yeah you know so the kid will gravitate towards an yeah. adult that they get along with and yeah. the adult will like having the kid there because they like that kid yeah and man the pressure that's taken off forcing relationships it's like a teacher has 30 something students in their class they can't like them all equally. Mm -hmm. They can't feel like <laughs> yeah. what they're contributing is what the kid is needing. I mean, I just remember all my years in school, sometimes you get a teacher that you're on the same wavelength and it's really formative and they really help you and you really are glad that you met them. And sometimes you get a teacher who's like, yeah, and I had a year. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as they're behaving themselves reasonably and conducting themselves professionally, yeah. you know, that's fine. Yeah. And then you get the ones that aren't even doing that. And, and, mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. yeah, it's been interesting. Mm. So, yeah, it's community building seems to be the thing. And, you know, uh, if we think about permaculture and nature study and we're looking mm. at forest communities, let's say, mm -hmm. we're learning not only, like, all the parts give something, but it isn't the same thing, and they all yeah. have needs, and they get what yeah. they need, and when they go about getting their needs, that process makes something better for other living yeah. things, and it yeah. all works. Yeah. So, I like to think about the people communities having yeah. that in common if they're going to work well yeah. and serve the members. Yeah. You know, it, it can't be extractive, it can't be right. exploiting, yeah. it can't be... Um, well, yeah, they can't be waste there either. Yeah. You know, they can't be waste people, yeah. they can't be waste activities, they can't be yeah. waste, you know, they can't be re waste due to um, everybody having to do their own uh -huh. waste, you know, right. everything from everything from heating oil. Yeah. Like if you, you're just the only person that lives in your house and you heat your house, right. there's another person next door that's the only person living in their house and right. they heat their house. What if we had fewer houses with more people in them? Yeah. We'd heat less houses. And kitchens. I mean, kitchens are the most yes. expensive part of a building to build, usually. And so and mm -hmm. then every house has its own complete, elaborate kitchen, right. or you have one That's community kitchen. That's the one kitchen. part nobody yeah. skimps on. You've That's right. got to have a refrigerator and a yeah. stove and plumbing and, and yeah. electricity and you know, appliances and... Yeah. yeah. But if you have a shared kitchen, then that's many multiple. That's a hearth yeah. that becomes what... It's like the cultural, anthropological description of yeah. hearth, which is a very the ubiquitous pattern in village life. Is and there were even the old oven, oven greenery shrines in the Medi in Mediterranean digs mm -hmm. where they're finding this. You know, there's a central courtyard, walled courtyard with multiple wood-fired ovens and counter space and, and greeneries, and which were all shrines. And it was a sacred space, but it was where everybody gathered and made their food, and all the kinds of social interactions mm -hmm. happened, and mm -hmm. ceremonies mm -hmm. happened, and probably wedding proposals happened, and business deals happened, and it was well, they, all going on They in happened space. through all kinds of yeah. you know, rich community interaction like that. Um, yeah. Even with the primitive skills gatherings that I've been going to for all this time, I could think of lots of long-term relationships and some right. weddings that have sprung from those. Plenty of business arrangements and yeah. opening schools and educational yeah. organizations and yeah. uh, people deciding to live in shared space together yeah. because it works and, and seed know. exchanges seed which yeah. is a big deal it's seed a big place where genetic transfer happens yeah. Yeah. information exchanges yeah yeah, yeah. 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 I, I love it it's it was like coming in out of the cold yeah totally well that makes me want to mention green's project which we were on mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. after the last in, in april with green Dr. Green Potter and um, Courtney Brook and myself talking about her pro her project over mm -hmm. in Dillsboro on MacTown Road, where she's getting this 40-acre thing going on around her um, rural medical clinic, and the idea is for that to be a community center and a retreat center and a hub for community activity, much like what we're talking about, smaller scale than Earth even. It would never it would never have the number of people at Earth even. Well, it's but only 40 acres. It's only 40 acres, but... It's like this. Yeah, so. it's steep pasture. <laughs> but for it to still be a place with trails and where people can learn to take care of themselves, yeah. not in the isolated um, framing of just human health, but how to take care of oneself by learning about interacting with other people in, yeah. in a natural setting and interacting with plants and learning about plant medicine and exercise and physical work and understanding that human health arises not by shooting down uh, disease 
necessarily only but by growing mm-hmm. a system of health from from good practices and habits and so I like she's that. trying to create that yeah I like thinking that you have microcosms and macrocosms and they're all systems with complicated parts. Yeah. So even just your individual health yeah. has to do with what's going in, what's going out, uh, yeah. where are you, yeah. um, you know, how do you think? And yeah. your mental e- ecology, in a sense, um, affects whether your immune system is going oh, so to police up all of the new organisms that you come in contact with right. or not. You know. What you eat affects the serotonin made in the belly, which right. is serotonin that goes happy? to the brain. Yeah. And then if you're depressed, then are you getting exercise and are you eating well? No, probably not. Because it reinforces the pattern. And even and if you were eating it, if you're depressed, are you are you assimilating it into your cells? You might that might affect yeah. all those things. So yeah. So um, sometimes when I do this show or I do any kind of a talk, I don't necessarily know the title till after I've finished the whole thing. Ah. So <laughs> so. What would you? How would you title our discussion? What we just talked about. Our, our, yeah. <laughs> well, we rambled, but we didn't. You know, yeah. we kept all all within one way of understanding. Yeah. So, I mean, we started talking about uh, the intersection between permaculture and primitive skills in nature study. Yeah. But it's. I think it's like tra- it's as much about community. Yeah. I think it's like transformational community through permaculture and earth skills. Or something like that. Oh, could that, that could do it. The word I use, I like the word transformational a lot of times because that is what we're doing. Where it's like, what I think we're doing is we're not tinkering around the edges of what is already happening in society. Like my my belief is that the central premises of the way our society and economy and politics are organized are heading us towards extinction. So we can't just tinker around the edges. I think it has to be transformational, and the transformation okay. works at all levels of sure. community, economy, individual awareness, ecology, and landscape. It's and all of those things interconnected, like we're talking about. So it has to be a transformational process, in my opinion. So that's I would say it's like that because that's what we're talking about. I think is, mm. but the transformation doesn't have to look like a blueprint and tearing something down and rebuilding something new out of new right, materials. Right. That would be actually outside the, the principles way. of the way we do it. Instead, exactly. it's like an enzymatic process, yeah. like the way that enzymes it's more of an transfer evolution proteins. It's more yeah. than an outside-in sort of, well, break this, clear away the rubble and start over. No. It's more of a, a thing changing from within because yeah. it serves the organism to do so. Right. So. Yeah, like a composting process. <laughs> and then, when you compost yeah. things that aren't working, they become topsoil. So I like to use the phrase, which is from Martin Prechtel, of, of cultural topsoil. That we're actually trying to accumulate cultural topsoil by composting down the things that aren't serving the system anymore and using them to grow the seeds in of the things that we do see the need for. I'll do it. So growing cultural topsoil. I like it. Well, I could go on talking about this stuff for hours and hours. And we hours, will. We have. Yeah. yeah, we will. We yeah. just spent an hour doing that. Yeah. So thank this you. is. Yeah. So this has been Earth Skills with Jeff Gottlieb and guest Zev Friedman, and uh, that was really fun. Yeah.